Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. During the Spanish colonization of the Americas, the Spanish Main was the collective term for the parts of the Spanish Empire that were on the mainland of the Americas and had coastlines on the Caribbean Sea or Gulf of Mexico. The term was used to distinguish those regions from the numerous islands Spain controlled in the Caribbean, which were known as the Spanish West Indies. The Spanish Main included Spanish Florida and New Spain, the latter extending through modern-day Texas and Mexico with a major port established along this stretch of coastline at the Spanish settlement of Veracruz. From the 16th to the early 19th century, Enormous wealth was shipped from the Spanish Main to Spain in the form of gold, silver, gemstones, spices, hardwoods, hides, and other valuable goods. Much of the wealth was silver in the form of pieces of eight. It was carried to the Spanish Main via the Pacific Coast. Other goods originated in the Far East, having been carried to the Pacific Coast of Spain's possessions on the Manila Galleons from Southeast Asia often through the Mexican port of Acapulco, and then transported overland to the Spanish Main for onward shipment to Europe. The Manila Galleons were Spanish trading ships which for 250 years linked the Spanish Philippines with Mexico across the Pacific Ocean, making one or two round-trip voyages per year between the ports of Acapulco and Manila, which were both part of New Spain. The Manila Galleons sailed the Pacific from 1565 to 1815, bringing to North America cargoes of luxury goods, such as spices and porcelain, in exchange for New World silver. The route also fostered exchanges that shaped the identities and culture of the countries involved. The Spanish Main became a frequent target for pirates, buccaneers, privateers, and nations at war with Spain, seeking to capture some of these riches. To protect this wealth, the Spanish treasure fleet was equipped with heavily armed galleons. The organization of the fleets in large convoys proved highly efficient, with only a few successful examples of major privateer attacks along the Spanish Main. Wishing to take part in this lucrative enterprise, Elizabethan England began sending expeditions to coastal North America in the hopes of discovering wealth and riches or taking possession of the treasure accumulated and transported by Spain. Following Sir Humphrey Gilbert's tragic death in 1583, Queen Elizabeth divided his land charter between his brother Adrian Gilbert and his half-brother Sir Walter Raleigh. Adrian's charter gave him the patent on Newfoundland and all points north, where geographers expected to eventually find a long-sought northwest passage to Asia. Raleigh was awarded the lands to the south, though much of it was already claimed by Spain. Raleigh's 1584 charter specified that he needed to establish a colony by 1591, or lose his right to colonization. He was to explore and exploit the territory, and was expected to establish a base from which to send privateers on raids against the treasure fleets of Spain. Despite the broad powers granted to Raleigh, he was forbidden to leave the Queen's side. Instead of personally leading voyages to the Americas, he delegated the missions to his associates and oversaw operations from London. Here is the tale of the first voyage to Virginia in 1584. The first voyage made to the coasts of America with two barks, wherein were Captains M. Philip Amatus and M. Arthur Barlow, who discovered part of the country now called Virginia, anno 1584. Written by one of the said captains, and sent to Sir Walter Raleigh Knight, at whose charge and direction the said voyage was set forth. The 27th day of April, in the year of our redemption, 1584, we departed from the west of England, with two barks well furnished with men and victuals, having received our last and perfect directions by your letters, confirming the former instructions and commandments, delivered by yourself at our leaving the River of Thames. The 2nd of July we found shoal water, where we smelt so sweet and so strong a smell, as if we had been in the midst of some delicate garden, abounding with all kind of odoriferous flowers, by which we were assured that the land could not be far distant. 
And keeping good watch, and bearing but slack sail, the fourth of the same month we arrived upon the coast, which we supposed to be a continent and firm land, and we sailed along the same a hundred and twenty English miles before we could find any entrance or river issuing into the sea. The first that appeared unto us, we entered, though not without some difficulty, and cast anchor about three arquebus shot within the haven's mouth on the left hand of the same. And after thanks given to God for our safe arrival thither, we manned our boats, and went to view the land next adjoining, and to take possession of the same in the right of the Queen's most excellent majesty, as rightful Queen and Princess of the same. And after, delivered the same over to your use, according to Her Majesty's grant and letters patent under Her Highness's great seal. We passed from the seaside towards the tops of those hills next adjoining, being but of mean height. And from thence we beheld the sea on both sides to the north, and to the south, finding no end any of both ways. The land lay stretching itself to the west, which after we found to be but an island of twenty miles long, and not about six miles broad. Under the bank or hill whereon we stood, we beheld the valleys replenished with goodly cedar trees, and having discharged our arquebus shot, such a flock of cranes, the most part white, arose under us, with such a cry, redoubled by many echoes, as if an army of men had shouted all together. We remained by the side of this island two whole days before we saw any people of the country. The third day we espied one small boat rowing towards us, having in it three persons. This boat came to the island side, four arquebus shot from our ships, and there, two of the people remaining, the third came along the shore side toward us, and we, being then all within board, he walked up and down the point of land next unto us. Then the master and pilot of the admiral, Simon Ferdinando, and the captain, Philip Amatus, myself and others, rode to the land, whose coming this fellow attended, never making any show of fear or doubt. And after he had spoken of many things not understood by us, we brought him, with his own good liking, aboard the ships, and gave him a shirt, a hat, and some other things, and made him taste of our wine and our meat, which he liked very well. And after having viewed both barks, he departed, and went to his own boat again, which he had left in a little cove or creek adjoining. Soon as he was too bowshot into the water, he fell to fishing and in less than half an hour he had laden his boat as deep as it could swim, with which he came again to the point of the land. And there he divided his fish into two parts, pointing one part to the ship and the other to the pinnace, which after he had as much as he might, requited the former benefits received, departed out of our sight. The next day there came unto us divers boats, and in one of them the king's brother, accompanied with forty or fifty men, very handsome and goodly people, and in their behavior as mannerly and civil as any of Europe. His name was Gran Gianameo, and the king is called Wingina, the country Winjandacoa, and now by Her Majesty Virginia. The manner of his coming was in this sort. He left his boats all together, as the first man did, a little from the ships by the shore, and came along to the place over against the ships, followed with forty men. When he came to the place, his servants spread a long mat upon the ground, on which he sat down, and at the other end of the mat four others of his company did the like. The rest of his men stood round about him somewhat afar off. When he came to the shore to him with our weapons, he never moved from his place, nor any of the other four, nor never mistrusted any harm to be offered from us. But sitting still he beckoned us to come and sit by him, which we performed. And being set, he made all signs of joy and welcome, striking on his head and his breast, and afterwards on ours, to show we all were one, smiling and making show, the best he could, of all love and familiarity. After he had made a long speech unto us, we presented him with divers things, which he received very joyfully and thankfully. None of the company durst speak one word all the time. Only the four which were at the other end spoke one in the other's ear very softly. A day or two after this, we fell to trading with them, exchanging some things that we had for chamois, buff, and deerskins. When we showed him all our packet of merchandise, of all things that he saw, a bright tin dish most pleased him, which he presently took up and clapped it before his breast, and after made a hole in the brim thereof, and hung it about his neck, making signs that it would defend him against his enemy's arrows. For these people maintain a deadly and terrible war with the people and king adjoining. 
We exchanged our tin dish for twenty skins, worth twenty crowns or twenty nobles, and a copper kettle for fifty skins, worth fifty crowns. They offered us good exchange for our hatchets and axes and for knives, and would have given anything for swords, but we would not depart with any. After two or three days, the king's brother came aboard the ships, and drank wine and ate of our meat and our bread, and liked exceedingly thereof. And after a few days overpassed, he brought his wife with him to the ships, his daughter, and two or three children. His wife was very well favored, of mean stature, and very bashful. She had on her back a long cloak of leather, with the fur side next to her body, and before her a piece of the same. About her forehead she had a band of white coral, and so had her husband many times. In her ears she had bracelets of pearl hanging down to her middle, whereof we delivered your worship a little bracelet, and those were of the bigness of good peas. The rest of her women, of the better sort, had pendants of copper hanging in either ear, and some of the children of the king's brother and other noblemen's have five or six in either ear. He himself had upon his head a broad plate of gold, or copper, for being unpolished we knew not what metal it should be. Neither would he by any means suffer us to take it off his head, but feeling it it would bow very easily. His apparel was as his wife's, only the women wear their hair long on both sides, and the men but on one. They are of color yellowish, and their hair black for the most part, and yet we saw children that had very fine auburn and chestnut colored hair. After that, these women had been there, there came down from all parts great store of people, bringing with them leather, coral, divers kinds of dyes, very excellent, and exchanged with us. But when Grand Janameo, the king's brother, was present, none durst trade but himself, except such as wear red pieces of copper on their heads like himself. For that is the difference between the noblemen and the governors of countries, and the meaner sort. And we both noted there, and you have understood since by these men which we brought home, that no people in the world carry more respect to their king, nobility, and governors than these do. The king's brother's wife, when she came to us, as she did many times, was followed with forty or fifty women always. And when she came into the ship, she left them all on land, saving her two daughters, her nurse, and one or two more. The king's brother always kept this order. As many boats as he would come with all to the ships, so many fires would he make on the shore afar off, to the end we might understand with what strength and company he approached. Their boats are made of one tree, either of pine or of pitch trees, a wood not commonly known to our people nor found growing in England. They have no edge tools to make them withal. If they have any, they are very few, and those it seems they had twenty years since, which, as those two men declared, was out of a wreck which happened upon their coast of some Christian ship, being beaten that way by some storm and outrageous weather, whereof none of the people were saved, but only the ship, or some part of her, being cast upon the sand, out of whose sides they drew the nails and the spikes, and with those they made their best instruments. The manner of making their boats is thus. They burn down some great tree, or take such as are windfallen, and, putting gum and resin upon one side thereof, they set fire into it, and when it hath burned it hollow, they cut out the coal with their shells, and ever, where they would burn it deeper or wider, they lay on gums which burn away the timber, and by this means they fashion very fine boats, and such as will transport twenty men. Their oars are like scoops, and many times they set with long poles as the depth serveth. The king's brother had great liking of our armor, a sword, and divers other things which we had, and offered to lay a great box of pearls in gauge for them. But we refused it for this time, because we would not make them know that we esteemed thereof, until we had understood in what places of the country the pearl grew, which now your worship doth very well understand. He was very just of his promise, for many times we delivered him merchandise upon his word. But ever he came within the day and performed his promise. He sent us every day a brace or two of fat bucks, conies, hares, fish, the best in the world. I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you're enjoying the ride.